Wow, so full house. It's great to, uh, great to be here, and it's real privilege and honor for me to introduce uh, Denis Villeneuve uh, to, uh, to Google and uh, to DeepMind to come and talk to us about uh, his amazing new movie, uh, Blade Runner 2049. So um, I'm sure, like many of you, Blade Runner is actually one of my favorite films of all time, um, probably my, my absolute favorite. And uh, it's actually one of the main reasons I got into AI in the first place when I saw it when I was a sort of um, teenager, young teenager. It made such an impression on me um, and how amazing sort of AI was portrayed in the film. Uh, that's why I ended up doing my whole career on it. And uh, I'm also a huge fan of Denise's work, uh, Sicario, Arrival, Prisoners. I'm sure you've all seen these films. An amazing film director. So I was so excited to hear that he was going to um, take the helm for, for the new Blade Runner film. So welcome, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. So um, how did you approach, you know, sort of trying to uh, build, do a sequel to something that was so iconic with, you know, all the legions of fans out there, um, something that they're, you know, such big fans of. How did you approach that? Well, first of all, I have to say that before I start, I must say that I'm very, I feel very humble in front of you, everybody, <laughs> because you are all experts, you know, in science um, and uh, in AI, most of you, I think, and uh, me, I'm just a filmmaker. <laughs> so I'm just saying I, I don't think I have something you, I, I, I can, I'm happy to be with you to share my experience about the making of Blade Runner uh, 2049 with you today, but I, d I don't think you will learn anything about your, <laughs> your film. <laughs> I'll, I'm, I'm feeling a bit nervous. But about, about the, the, um, the um, no, the, the, the first of all, when I, uh, I heard that uh, Ridley Scott, that uh, Andrew Kosov and, and Broderick Johnson from Alcon were uh, part, uh, starting a project with, uh, that will be a, a follow-up to the first Blade Runner. The first time I heard about it, I said to myself, wow, what an insane, <laughs> strong, beautiful, great, bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> because it's like, uh, as, uh, like you, the first yeah. movie is, uh, is uh, by far one of my, my favorite one. It's a movie that is linked to the, my birth of love to cinema. I mean, where I started to dream to be a, a, a director. So it's like a church, you know, and uh, um, and the thing is that what convinced me was the screenplay. When I read the screenplay, when I had the chance to read the screenplay, uh, the screenplay was written uh, at first by Anton Fincher, who was the, the the writer of the original movie. Came with a very strong, strong ideas, very strong poem, and then uh, uh, and it it, it 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 worked in collaboration with Ridley. So from the start, that secures me a lot. The idea that the, the both fathers were uh, at the helm of the of the project, and then Michael Green came on board and made a, a very strong screenplay. And um, um, from there, uh, all the pressure was before I took the decision, because um, like I had a talk with Ryan Gosling at one point that will resume the the the, the spirit of uh, the journeys. Uh, we said to ourselves, both to, together at the beginning when we decided both to do it, is that uh, our chances of success were very narrow. <laughs> that it was like, uh, and to accept that, that uh, no matter what we will do, we knew that we will com be compared to a masterpiece yeah. and a movie that everybody loved. And uh, that uh, people will come in theaters with baseball bats, you know. And, uh, <laughs> and by the way, if I, 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 I'm a, a, a huge fan, if if the movie had, had been done by someone else, I will have been the same. I'll, I'll be the same. Yeah. I will go in the. <laughs> and and um, knowing that it gave us, and when you accept that, you accept that fate, then you become free. And 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 it's a very. Uh, so you you're not. Uh, um, <laughs> bound to success or you're not thinking about the result, you're thinking, thinking about creating a pure artistic act. Mm. And, uh, and I think everybody shared the same pressure on the crew, from Roger Deakins to Dennis Gassner to all the people that worked on the movie that we all, um, 
felt that pressure, and the other uh, only way to work on that uh, with that pressure was to get rid of it by by uh, accepting uh, that fact. Mm. Yeah. So did Ridley? Like, how much creative input did he have once the filming started? Ridley, and other things was did he have a strong that, idea in mind already? Uh, 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 Ridley uh, uh, at the beginning was supposed to direct it, and and he didn't f for a simple reason is that he he was too busy. He has a schedule. Uh, uh, a lot of project in his mind, and uh, in the other way, on, uh, on the other end, Harrison Ford, let's face it, is no spring chicken. I mean, he's like a, <laughs> he, 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 he wanted to uh, uh, shoot soon, you so know, and and uh, and, the, the <laughs> <laughs> and the, the, uh, the screenplay was ready. Harrison loved the screenplay, and and uh, so that's why I came on board. And and uh, so the input of, of Ridley is in, is huge because he created the screenplay. He wrote the screenplay with uh, Hampton and Michael. So that's huge, you know, and, and uh, uh, he's uh, at the birth of the ideas. Yeah. So from how did there, you make from it? From there, from there, when I met him, uh, me to get on board, I needed his, his blessing. That was yeah. one of my, let's say, conditions to get on board. I need, I, I need to meet the man, yeah. look, look at him in the eyes, and say, is it OK? Yeah. <laughs> because, <laughs> and, and, and he was very um, gracious, very uh, gentleman, very, um, uh, he welcomed me, uh, uh, said, said that he was happy that I would do it, and he um, uh, basically gave me all the elements uh, that uh, the genesis, what was behind the first movie, all, all the, the, the source of inspirations, the background, the, the context of the first movie, and, and what, uh, what was behind it. Mm. And uh, but for this one, he said it's yours. You're totally free. If you need me, I'll be at the end at the end of the, the phone. But uh, otherwise, I, I, I uh, you're totally free. He, ga uh, in, he gave me what we say in, in French, carte blanche. Mm -hmm. It means uh, it's my movie. I, it's my responsibility. Mm -hmm. So if you don't like it, it's my fault. <laughs> it has nothing to. And and uh, other, it's it's uh, the only way I was able to work is uh, to work with Ridley behind me would have been totally impossible. Let's yeah. say uh, we were as a way. At the time, I think he was doing Prometheus, yeah. very far away. I was very, uh, the only way I was, uh, and, and that I, I'm very grateful because that was very generous of him. Yeah. So did he already have uh, this idea in mind when he was doing the original film or, or of a sequel or what the sequel would be about? Or when did that come I, about? I heard, uh, I, I heard different stories about that. I know, I remember he told me that uh, at one point, uh, he, you know, the original Blade Runner was born at the time where there was Star Wars yeah. and, 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 and uh, Indiana Jones, all the birth of those sequels. And I know that Ridley was like, uh, really loved the first Star Wars. Mm. And you, in fact, he was traumatized when he saw it. He was <laughs> like, oh God, it's so good. Yeah. So he, 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 <laughs> um, um, he, I think the idea, there was an idea at the time that it could have done a sequel with yeah. that character. He was seeing, he, he knew that the, the, was the universe was, that was bigger. Yeah. It's just that the way uh, the, the production ended, it was, it was not possible. Yeah. It just took the skills of a uh, producer, the Alcon, to be able to, it was like the, the, basically the rights of the movie were in that kind of a no man's land right. war zone. It Actually was like put it all together. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a kind of a So what process did you go through to uh, make it your own universe and your own yeah, story? That's the, that's the, yeah. the thing is that it's, it was to, uh, it took uh, a lot of time and meditation to be able to make my, uh, you know, it's a thing to make a movie. It's a lot of work, but to take someone else's dream, to take someone else's characters, to uh, aesthetics, it's like uh, so. The the way to do it is like uh, I started by uh, saying to myself, uh, I, it's a, it was a for me, uh, 2049 is a kind of love letter to the original Blade Runner. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I um, we decided that I say we because I I started uh, right at the beginning to work with Roger Deakins. I bring, mm -hmm. brought him on board quite early this time because I was doing uh, finishing Arrival at the time and I needed his uh, input, his uh, wisdom, his, uh, his ideas uh, right at the start. It was such a huge task, so I needed a close partner from the start and uh, we spent several weeks in Montreal in a hotel room with a storyboard artist to start to draw, to, to, to interpret, to transform the screenplay into a, into a movie there together. Yeah. So I will say that it's by far a very the movie uh, was decanized from the start. You yeah. know, it's a very, very uh, strong input in the movie. Yeah. Um, the idea was that uh, I, uh, when you are uh, with, uh, I'm working with someone else's story. I always try to find an intimate way to get into the story. To, to I have to create an intimate link. And uh, one of them, it's, it's, it's going to sound trivial for you, but it was huge for me to, to aesthetically. 
it was the climate and the screenplay was different than the first movie. It was more like uh, there was the idea that uh, there will be snow, there will be winter will be present. And I mean, I mean, as a Canadian, there's one thing I know about is, uh, <laughs> snow. is uh, that I can deal with. And it, it has a strong influence and strong impact yeah, on the light, right. on the atmospheres. And, and, and uh, to, so, to approach Ridley's universe through the lens of something that is so familiar to me. Mm. Uh, it helped me to, uh, to define uh, uh, what I will keep from the first movie and what I will enhance and what I will create different to make it my own. Mm. And climate was a strong thing, I will mm. say. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it has such a strong style, the first Blade Runner. I mean, one of the things, yeah, the yeah, landscape. Exactly, and yeah. I, one, one thing I always found interesting about it was this juxtaposition between very uh, modern technology, obviously the replicants themselves, flying cars, but also combined with quite old technology like pay phones and even the you know voight camp machine was very analog right so that's you know you thing. Didn't, so there was a sort of combination of analog quite old retro and things and very I, modern things as i was doing the movie yeah. sometimes i was feeling i was more doing a period movie than a sci-fi movie mm. because yeah. you guys are so ahead you make our lives very difficult to make sci-fi today. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's, it's very often, and there's a lot of uh, uh, work that is done today that is virtual, that is yeah. abstract, that for storytelling and, uh, and uh, also technology make a, a job, uh, detective stories quite boring, you know, mm. okay, I'm gonna find something, you take a keyboard and you take, yeah. <laughs> so exactly. it's, like, it's like we need, there's nothing more boring for a director than to shoot a character in front of a screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, the screenwriter had a brilliant idea. Mm. Uh, I thought, uh, uh, I love this idea because it, it created a, a, a landscape that allowed me to create a, an adventure, which mm. is that, it's a thing I can talk about, is that in, in, the, in between the first movie and the second one, there was an event, an uh, EMP, that uh, created a, a blackout, which is that humanity lost that data. They lost, the, the digital world went, uh, I'm sorry guys, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> it happened. <laughs> and, 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 and we, so the, the, there was the, the, the world in 2049, we went back to a analog technology. Mm -hmm. So we went back to an analog I world see. where they rely on, 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 only on uh, real, on concrete, con uh, not concrete, uh, what is the concrete? Translator, okay. <laughs> Something that tangible, you know, yes. t tangible technology, analog technology, and that uh, for me was a blessing because it allowed my character to travel, to open doors, to yep. win rooms, to meet people, to <laughs> get ask away questions. from the screen. Yeah, yeah, get away from the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Fantastic. And I, and and uh, I'm I'm about to make another sci-fi movie, mm -hmm. and my goal is to try to avoid screens again. So just right. to try to be in contact with the reality more. Yeah. Fantastic. So another really important, I think, um, sort of pillar of the atmosphere in the first film was the music. You know, the, I think the Vangelis score was kind of an amazing score and, and, and actually created a part, a lot of the feeling of the film. How did you approach the, the, the very, music for the new very, film? It's a very, very important element. Yeah. That it was such an iconic score because it, it's, uh, it was like, you know, the landscape that we, we all saw in, in the first movie were so dystopic, dystopic and, and dystopian and, and, and uh, dark and depressive, but on top of it, you had that beautiful, melancholic, poetic, very delicate music, you know, mm. with those uh, dark spectral drums that were like, uh, uh, created a kind of religious <laughs> feeling on top of it. And, and that uh, is, a, uh, um, we did a lot of exploration, a lot of exploration with music, but uh, you know, when you do a Blade Runner mu movie, you cannot go very far from the CS80, which mm. is the original synthesizer that yeah. Vangelis used. Incredible. And I insisted, uh, and I, I, it's just a thing that I, at one point I had to put my feet and I said, okay, we are going in that direction. As much as uh, Roger and I, um, we, uh, Roger Deakins and I, we tried to uh, make sure that some part of the movie will be very close aesthetically to the first movie because it's still a detective film noir story. It's a Blade Runner movie. Mm -hmm. You have to be in that kind of zone, aesthetic zone, and, and, and it's the same for the sound. So we work very hard to create that sound soundtrack that will be as uh, close to the sound effect, a bit like in the first one, and at the same time to have that kind of melancholia that is so beautiful, mm -hmm. and that very specific sound. Those, those uh, CS80, they are beasts. Uh, they are like really <laughs> impressive machines, very delicate. Uh, and um, I'm very proud of the score. I must say that's a thing that, I, you know, when you make a movie, I, I just finished a movie a few, few uh, weeks ago. I have no distance. But the, um, 
there's some elements of it that I'm, and I know that the score, the Ben Wallfish and Anne Zimmer did a fantastic job. Yeah, I can't wait to hear that. So it sounds like you're a big fan of science fiction. I mean, you say you're doing another science fiction film, but uh, it's interesting that, you know, as, a, as an AI um, practitioner, you know, often in films, portrayal of AI and robots is usually sometimes negative and antagonistic. You know, yeah. some notable exceptions like uh, the robots in Interstellar, TARS and yeah, Case, yeah, they were yeah. fantastic. So I hope you, you produce some films with a positive image of AI <laughs> in the future. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, but, but with the original, yeah, but with interesting, the original Blade Runner, what, you know, the replicants were, you know, maybe they were the heroes of the film. I was always thinking, do you feel like Ruka Hauer and Roy Batty's character was actually the hero of the that's film? That's the thing that I think yeah. uh, 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 um, make the people uh, uh, got the people confused mm. about the first film is that Harrison Ford, who was at the time Han Solo and Indiana Jones was not yeah. a hero. I know, it's true. He was a dark hero, yeah. anti-hero. Yeah. And that was like very confusing for people and that, uh, uh, no, definitely the replicants are, they are a mirror of ourselves. you know? They are like, uh, they represent our anger to our, our maker, you know, the, yeah. the, the, our human condition. You know, I think one of the things that we all fell in love with with the first Blade Runner, and, and I'm sure you're continuing the new film, is it's not really a film about technology in some ways, right? It's actually about philosophy and deeper things like consciousness, identity, um, and, and you know what it means to be alive, mortality. I think that's what it definitely. Was about, it's right? a, it's a, it's a, it's a, um, I will say that uh, again. Uh, uh, that uh, we we respected that mm. that spirit in the second one. It's like it's the, the technology is there to uh, create a more dynamic story, but it's not uh, it's not um, in the foreground at all. Mm. Uh, uh, it's uh, I will say it's it's uh, it's there to be exciting, but still the the core of the movie is about humanity, what it means to be a human. Oh, as human, in some ways, we are programmed ourselves mm. from our uh, education and and from our uh, genetic background, and how how can we get free and uh, out uh, can, can we get out of the road can we can we can we get free uh, get rid of that background and get have more freedom you know mm. and that's the way i see the movie right now movies about broken dreams too which is very melancholic and uh, yeah. there's a beautiful melancholia that i that was the main thing i was trying to protect uh, mm. to have the same kind of uh, yeah, beautiful melancholy, I would say. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the Blade Runner seemed to suggest that um, the, the difference between replicants and humans was sort of the emotional, empathetic side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah and yeah. this idea of uh, memories and, and having episodic memory, a memory of your past. Uh, and I guess another thing it seemed to suggest was that the longer the replicants lived, the more emotions they would sort of develop. So hence the termination date. But... Um, you know, what if, it, I, I don't know if you're exploring this in the new film, but what if they do live longer and they do develop emotions and feelings and empathy? Would there be much difference, in your opinion, then, of, you know, retiring a replicant and killing a human? But uh, uh, the thing is that uh, if, in the first movie, the, 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 the thing is that they were, they were the, the fact that they had a short-term hmm. uh, life, they developed uh, anger toward their, their maker. And in the second movie, I can say that, uh, of course, like the screenwriter uh, used to say to me, is like if a company developed an iPad that uh, was able to kill people, you you will try to find a solution before selling another iPad. You, oh. you will try to find <laughs> a, a new way to create. The, so so they, they definitely they, 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 they are new replicants mm. in the movie that had been uh, uh, with a longer lifespan. Mm. Because if you think about it, if they didn't have a longer lifespan, 30 years later, there will be no more more problems. So it means that they had they had created a, a new line of replicants with. Uh, 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 long term, uh, and that, uh, but what, that was not, uh, that didn't solve all the problems. And um, because there's always that strong pressure, that strong uh, anxiety that came from a uh, condition. So if you're a human or bioengineer human, you're still dealing with this fact that you don't know why you are on this place. And, uh, and the fact that uh, basically, the, also, there's another factor is that the replicants are designed to be. They are basically designed to be slaves. Mm. So they, they, I think that in the second movie, it's more about being citizens, uh, considered mm -hmm. as real citizens. And that is uh, <coughs> one of the, the main topic. Main of, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as an artist, do, do you feel that there are some aspects of humanity and being human that could never be simulated? Never. Uh, Artificially? Do you, would you say? <laughs> Help me. Okay, okay. No, but 
it's it's um you know it's like it's like the complexity of humanity that uh, uh that struggle to uh to uh get ri rid of the voices that are coming from uh, the past you know that i think you can't recreate with an ai that uh, mm. that that the the fact that uh my weakness right now mm. how do you recreate that sure. yeah that and those weaknesses are a, a very complex product of uh, of my mm. the education i received and from what uh, the gift that i received from uh the parents uh, are through the generation, the generations, you know. Yeah, that. Uh, yeah, it'd be hard it's to your problem. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So uh, one one of the my f I mean I think the last scene of of uh, of Blade Runner was is one of my I mean probably one of the I, I would say one of the greatest scenes in all of cinema uh, with with Roy Batty and he you know he Rutger Hauer sort of releases the dove into the air as he dies. Do you think what do you think that symbolizes? I always thought that symbolized that the replicant felt he had a soul. Yeah, but, it's uh, really, that's is that what you read it's from a, it's it a, it's a, it's a, That's the way I read it too, and it, mm. it's a it's a beautiful, uh, he, uh, it's a beautiful image. Image, and what I love also about this image is that it came from Rodger Hour. Yeah, so, I love it. I love it when actors bring strong, strong uh, ideas on on uh, uh, when an actor is like uh, totally uh, engulfed, like totally. Uh, imbued that totally uh, uh, in possession of his, uh, his character, you know, mm -hmm. good actors, strong actors, they can become muse <coughs> and they bring strong ideas. And I had the same uh, experience with Ryan Gosling, mm. who uh, brought some very strong ideas on, on uh, there's some scenes that I'm very proud of of the scene in the movies that honestly, uh, uh, one of my best se favorite scenes is a uh, Ryan Gosling idea, you know. Right. So and you I like your actors to improvise? I deeply love it. I, the script. I, I, I love when I'm from the documentary, where uh, the thing I love about documentary is like you put your camera in life, and suddenly sometimes life organizes itself. There's an accident in front of the camera that create a strong <coughs> cinematic moment mm -hmm. in from cinematic poetry in front of the camera. And I, the way I, I, I find it back in the fiction is uh, with actors. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more exciting for me than when an actor come on set and say, I didn't sleep, I had this idea. And I have this. I have to try this yeah. idea. That I love. Yeah. yeah. And I know that the, uh, it's the same <laughs> with Roger Deakins. We we try to create, to be ready. We the movie is very a storyboard. Everything is planned, but we always keep a space on set to make sure that the actors have the space to recreate something that was not planned. That uh, was uh, always linked with the scenes, of course. But it's there's nothing more, nothing more exciting for me than that than an idea that was not. Expecting yeah. that surprised me. Yeah. That's I call it the chaos of life, you know. Yeah. That and and it's like uh, that's why I think that computer generated the uh, characters are always most of the time they are created by uh, uh, people behind the camera that they, they don't have they cannot create that spontaneity that yeah. those accidents yeah. that uh, bring sparks of life and a surprise and that's why we are we are becoming so. Uh, uh, surprised and excited uh, as an audience member. That we, that's why cinema can evolve. Yeah. That's where cinema can evolve. It's when we capture life in front of the camera. <coughs> and uh, there's some moments like that in the, in the several moments like that in Blade Runner 2049. Fantastic. And those are the, to that. my favorite ones. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I can't imagine that film without Ruka Hauer sort of improvising those last lines. I think it, it really those makes the exa film. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and that's one of one of the reasons why also I love real sets, real envi environment that we constructed the sets and. Uh, and I guess uh, it stimulates that in the actors probably. The right? actor can focus on his interior and not on, on not uh, trying to imagine and to be, be in relationship with something that is virtual. Yeah. That's why I don't like green screens. I like real environments. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Well, we should. I'm sure there's many uh, questions from the audience. We should open it up to yeah, the yeah, audience please. now for for questions. Please, I should be, we should have some mics around the place. So, <laughs> am I allowed to ask a question about Arrival? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I think so. Or will like I get like bounced by? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, uh, so yes. Yes, yes, okay, yes, great. yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, Arrival, uh, amazing. That was my baseball bat moment. Uh, the Ted Chiang short story, Stories of Our Lives, is so, so impactful, so beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I wanted to. Uh, but it's so tied up in in language and the written word and the way that he sort of, I don't know if everybody, ha I know who's read it here, but go read it, it's awesome. Um, 
but the way it's tied up in language and written word is so uh, complicated. How did you approach turning the story of time and language and how it affects the mind into something that you could put on screen? You know what? When you, when you do an adaptation, um, it's a very violent, violent process. But you need to, to uh, there's a brutal moment when you need to destroy the original. The, 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 I don't know if you, you read all the short story from Te Chang, the story of your life. It's a little masterpiece. It's a gem. It, uh, and as you rightly said, it's like uh, the way you play with language and time. And, and it's so beautiful and, and so clever and so brilliant. And uh, to do a movie out of it, it's, it's like, a, um, first of all, uh, uh, when I read it, I know, uh, producer offered me to, uh, to adapt it. Uh, I didn't know how to, because it felt like, a, um, I said to them, it's like a fantastic story. And there's a movie there. But how? Because it's a story about a process, a repetitive process, an intellectual process. And, uh, and uh, to find a cinematic structure out of this, it took a screenwriter, Eric Eiser, that came uh, on board and created um, that fine this idea of creating a tension, a geopolitic tension that was making it maybe more uh, accessible story. And um, that was the key. Then uh, um, the rest is a, is a, was a long process to, uh, to, to the, the challenge of this, this movie was really to make sure that, because basically it's a teacher that makes students, you know, and they, they are teaching a language together. So how do you make this like a, dynamic story that will not feel repetitive and that will stay. Uh, it, uh, it took a long time in the screenwriting process, even in shooting, and the movie transformed itself. Not the main story, but the, the process uh, to find the right rhythm and the right elements. It was a, there's no, it's not a simple question. It, uh, it was a lot, it was a puzzle to make the, by far the longest uh, uh, editing uh, sessions of my life, the most complex sessions. And uh, no, it was not a given at the beginning. It was a very, very uh, difficult movie to do. Yeah, I will say. Well, thank you for doing it so well. But, but that's a c very huge compliment coming. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. There are, I believe, at least six different cuts of the original Blade Runner with, in some cases, noticeably different endings. Did that make doing a sequel difficult? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing, <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, yeah. that uh, to make a uh, yeah, that's a good question. The thing is that uh, basically I, I stood between both fathers, you know, because Harrison Ford and Ridley Scott they still don't agree about it. Uh, they, they still, yeah. and and uh, I found the 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 answer in the uh, Philip K. Dick novel, where the characters. I love the idea of a, uh, uh, they are doubting about themselves. The cops, the Blade Runners in, in the Philip K. Dick novel, they are sometimes uh, saying to themselves, uh, maybe I should do the, do the voice cam for myself because this morning I'm not sure if I'm human or not. You know, it's <laughs> like they, they, and I love this idea. I love the idea of, of, of keeping the question alive, to stay in the, in the f to walk the fine line, fine line of the doubt. And it's a thing that reassured me from the start, Hampton Fancher wrote a story, the, the story of uh, 2049 is, is um, basically a uh, walk on this line. Is Deckard as a replicant or not? And I love the fact that he, 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 st he, he stayed uh, on the question and not given any answers. So it's, um, if Ridley Scott was sitting here, he would look at me and said, what the hell is he talking about? <laughs> so he will, he will, because he, he, uh, but me, I love the fact that uh, Deckard is doubting about his own identity. Even him is un isn't sure about that, that I love. Yeah. That for me is like uh, what is a part of the movie is about, yeah. Yeah, Denis, that was one of the questions I w most wanted to ask you actually was, could you clear up the 30 year you know, mystery I had of when I when I used to spend hours arguing with my friends about was Deckard uh, a replicant, and but then the director's cut seemed to confirm, in my opinion, for sure with yeah, the yeah, unicorn yeah, yeah, dream, yeah. the dream, yeah, the yeah, unicorn yeah. in his dream, and yeah, then yeah. the little unicorn, uh, you know, origami. So are you are you going to answer that? But then you show an aged Harrison Harrison Ford. So then now it seems to suggest either the replicants can age or. Or uh, he's not a replicant. You, you, you have to watch the movie. Right. <laughs> so so do, do you actually answer it? Oh, OK, I'm going to see. No, no, <laughs> Even then you that, can't, the meta that, question. The, the, the thing is that, yeah. honestly, it's a thing I can see without uh, giving any spoilers, that I think that, uh, again, questions, 
create vertigo questions like why I love one of the reasons I love sci-fi is because it's like it, it allows you in a very dynamic dynamic way to approach existential questions mm. are like and 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 uh, those existential questions brings you in contact with the unknown which create a beautiful vertigo and uh, the, the question of the the I love this feeling and and is Deckard as a human or not mm. for me I, I love the question the mm. answer is less interesting for Yeah, you want to keep the tension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The tension yeah, yeah. is a big part of it. Yeah. So, I, did, I mean, it, it, I read interviews of Harrison Ford, and obviously it's famously, you know, he apparently didn't like the original, but is it just the different interpretations of the original? Is that what was the argument about? Or Because presumably he, he does like it because he's, he's starring in the sequel. Is, I, I think that uh, if, if uh, Harrison, from uh, what yeah. I understood, and I, I don't want to put words in his yeah. mouth, but if you are asking me from what I understand is that he felt that a man, a human being, falling in love with, with a, a, an artificial human being was quite poetic and strong and beautiful and rose a lot of questions. Mm. Then the two androids, uh, not androids, but two replicants falling in love mm -hmm. wanted to, he felt it was less interesting for him. Yeah. The idea that, uh, and, 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 and uh, I think that when he, 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 for him, when he shot the movie as an actor, mm. He played it as a human. Yeah. I mean, he, he has a different yeah. reaction. He has, a, he's like, a, he has different qualities. He has different, uh, and it was very, and it, it drove him through all this. So when he learned later that he was maybe a replicant, I think it's a <laughs> what. <the> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, 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 and he's still to these days. But me, I love the together. I mean, I think they had a tough shoot. Yeah. I think that they deeply respect each other. Yeah. And, and uh, maybe that tension is what made it so great, actually, yeah, the yeah, tension yeah, between agree, the two of them, the creative agree, tension. Yeah, yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Well, listen, I, I think that's all we got time for today, but it, I'm, I'm so looking forward to uh, seeing the new film and maybe getting some answers or some but, more questions. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.